Good morning. Y'all did better yesterday. But uh, I think the answer is because Miami. Uh, we have a special addition to our program. I am so grateful and proud of everything we've been able to offer you all for the last couple of days that we've all done together, frankly. Uh, this is special. I want you to pay attention because uh, as Dan talked about yesterday, what we're about to talk to you about is about being a real participant. So with that, I'm gonna cede the stage to two of my greatest friends, three of my greatest friends, Jade Floyd of the Case Foundation, Meredith Klein of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. You all got to meet yesterday. I hope you're as in love with her as we all are on the board. Jade and Meredith serve on our board and have for a number of years now. And uh, the man who actually makes the Communications Network run, Mr. Tristan Mahabir. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So the Communications Network seeks to showcase our best the field has to offer. And that's why we're thrilled to announce this morning the creation of the Clarence B. Jones Impact Award. <laughs> Many of you in this room know Dr. Jones as a pioneering speechwriter to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was not only Dr. King's attorney, advisor and confidant, he contributed to many of his speeches, including his famous speech at the March on Washington in 1963. Dr. Jones, and I'm gonna look at you as I talk about this, and try not to cry. Mm -hmm. He's, you're a hero of the civil rights movement. You're a paragon of what communications for good can mobilize. You share our common values here at the network, and you've really worked to deliver the change and champion all that the social sector needs. And that's why we created the Jones Award, not only to honor you, but to recognize the game-changing effect that strategic comms can have across the globe. And that's why impact is at the core of this award. We're excited to share today that nominations are open for our first ever Clarence B. Jones Impact Award. We invite each of you to visit jonesaward.org to learn more about the criteria, and we encourage you to submit your nominations. All members of the network are eligible to win the award, and any member of the network may submit a nomination. The award is going to celebrate individuals, teams, and organizations that have successfully used strategic communications to elevate social issues, to influence attitudes and beliefs, and to inspire action and social change. A worthy nomination will show that your efforts have elevated an issue. They've influenced attitudes. They've sparked and mobilized movements in really meaningful ways. The judging panel will be made up of communications leaders, including the network's board chair, select members of the network, and network staff. So please take the time over the next few weeks to visit jonesaward.org. We encourage everyone to think about the smart work you and your colleagues have done, innovative work you may have been following for years, or perhaps something inspiring and impressive you learned about just yesterday and submit a nomination for the Clarence B. Jones Impact Award. So nominations starting today are going to be accepted until January 12th. So be sure, whip out those laptops when you get back to the office and find someone meaningful in your career, in your office, perhaps even yourself. We really look forward to next year at ComNet 18, where we'll honor the first awardee. Chances are the honoree is sitting in this room or that you know the person who we will present this award from stage. So go to jonesaward.org, submit your de deserving communicators, and we will see you all next year. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you to Jade and Meredith for your leadership on this, which has been a pet project of mine this year at the network. Uh, and speaking of leadership, 
Let's talk about Dr. Clarence B. Jones. I know it's pretty obvious, but humor me and let me explain why, why we are naming this award in his honor. Dr. Jones was a communications director and much more before the title existed. Before the era of NGOs and foundations as we know it, Dr. Jones was leading the push for a more just society through his words and his actions. His fingerprints are all over one of America's most impactful communications successes, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream speech. And Dr. Jones is still at it over 50 years later. He's as enthusiastic and engaged a network member as we have, as many of you who have met him over the past few years can attest. And this is also a little personal for me, as a child of immigrants and a person of color. I know that the country my parents arrived in over 40 years ago and the country I grew up in was shaped for the better by Dr. Jones and his fellow activists. And for that, I am grateful. But there is more work to be done. You heard Grant say on this stage yesterday that with all that's going on, we cannot afford to remain silent. Dr. Jones is anything but. So Dr. Jones, on behalf of the Communications Network, it is my honor to present you with this token of our admiration and appreciation. And we cannot wait to showcase the best of what our sector has to offer in your name. Thank you. Eighty-six going on eighty-seven. I am aware of the uh, fragility of gratuitous, fortuitous longevity. There are only two other awards that have moved me, but even those two awards have not moved me as much as this has. The first was I received the Legacy of the Dream Award from Georgetown University at the Kennedy Center. and. Uh, there was not an empty seat in the Kennedy Center. And um, President and Ms. Obama was in their first term. And after my remarks, um, the President, I got a letter from the White House in which he had invited me to come to the White House based upon what he heard in my acceptance speech. Um, the second, time, the Harvey Milk Club of San Francisco asked if I would be their keynote speaker in commemorating, at that time, the 47th anniversary of the election of Harvey Milk, the first openly gay um, member, uh, you know, political leader in San Francisco. And that was followed by an invitation to go to San Diego, where they were naming a, a square after Harvey Milk. And they raised the uh, LBGTQ flag. And it was so moving, particularly after I had had the opportunity of being invited on the anniversary of Harvey Milk, 
I said that, uh, to the best of my recollection, I think I've been straight all my life. There are about, there are about 5,000 people, mostly uh, LGBTQ people in the audience. I said, but I don't know. <laughs> Today, I'm looking at some beautiful people out there, I said. <laughs> and a number of people came up afterwards and started hugging me. <laughs> Let me, let me say I have no illusions in spite of my personal gratitude. I know that I am a derivative beneficiary of those people just by the accident of longevity that I still represent. So that when I accepted the legacy of the Dream Award in the Kennedy Center, as I accept this award, I accept it humbly and gratefully, but I also accept it in the memory of the names of people like Fanny Lou Hamer. Victoria Gray, Reverend James Reeb, those four beautiful girls who were killed by dynamite on September 15, 1963 in the 16th Street Baptist Church. I accept this award in the names of James Orange, who you probably wouldn't know, in Birmingham. and of Michael Schwerner, James Cheney, and Andrew Goodman, killed by the Klan in Philadelphia, Mississippi. I accept this award in the name of Ella Baker, Constance Baker Motley, Thurgood Marshall, Charles Hamilton, great, extraordinary lawyers of Abraham Joshua Heschel. Accept this award in the name of Rabbi Yakum Prince. My parents were domestic household servants. My father had a fourth grade education, my mother an eighth grade education. When I was born as their only child, they had no home of their own. So the first six years of my life, I lived with them in the servants' quarters of where they worked. And then they sent me to a Catholic boarding school, where from essentially 6 to 14, I was raised in the loving hands of Catholic nuns, white Irish Catholic nuns. So, as I get closer to my own horizon, and you uh, named this award after me, uh, I don't know <laughs> that there is anything else that could ever more beautifully happen to me if I lived to be 100 years of age. So I thank you, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you from the bottom of my heart and don't you ever forget what I said, that this award may nominally bear my name, but my name is representative only of those persons who are no longer here to speak for themselves and collectively probably did more than I could ever do in my lifetime 
And before I could leave, I could not, I cannot say enough about this man who for seven and a half years, I, he said to me, Clarence, how is it possible? How did it happen that a Baptist preacher ended up having a lawyer who was raised by the Catholic nuns? <laughs> I said, I quote in paraphrasing something from a, I said, Martin, you know the Lord works in mysterious ways. He has wonders to perform. You have important things to do this morning, so I don't want to take up any more time other than to say I am uh, uh, supposed to be a master craftsman and uh, a wordsmith, and I am. I have some you know, pride and humility, you know, so forth. And I am, but this challenges, this challenges, the saying anything in response to this challenges any words that I could come up, either thoughtfully or spontaneously. So I thank you, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you very much. I think you guys are going to be okay if we go a little over. Yeah? Charles? I'm really sorry. <laughs> you have to follow that. Uh, my good friend Charles from the Helios Education Foundation is going to introduce our next... Uh, I'm at a loss. I'm sorry, guys. So uh, the first words I got over there were, I'm sorry you have to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, sir, for your inspiration and for your life well lived. Uh, good morning. So it's my pleasure to be here today surrounded by all of you as leaders in philanthropy and the nonprofit sector who are making a difference in communities throughout the country. I'm Charles Hokinson. I'm the Senior Vice President for Florida Community Engagement at the Helios Education Foundation. Helios is one foundation that is in two states. And our mission is to enrich the lives of individuals in both of those states by creating opportunities for success in post-secondary education. We understand that post-secondary education is not solely a result of courses taken on a university campus. Actually, post-secondary success starts with a high-quality early learning environment that prepares a child to learn the first day of kindergarten, surrounds that child with a college-going culture throughout middle and high school, and ultimately ensures that she enjoys an academic journey that is both challenging and motivational. But regrettably, here in 2017, the environment I just described is not accessible to every student in every community. Regrettably, in 2017, we still deal with issues of inequality that perpetuate education gaps starting very early in life. Too often these gaps are exaggerated, particularly among our minority students and underserved students. Our plenary guest today is an accomplished journalist who has explored the topic of minorities in America, among other impactful issues. Michelle Norris's journalistic career spans decades. Her byline has appeared in the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, the Los Angeles Times, among others. In addition to reporting on the tragedy of 9-11, for which she won an Emmy Award. Michelle has interviewed numerous presidents and global leaders. 
She joined NPR's evening news program, All Things Considered, in 2002, becoming NPR's first African-American female host. In 2010, Michelle began the Race Card Project in collaboration with NPR, a body of work for which she won a Peabody Award in 2014. Michelle has also reflected upon her own family legacy in the book, The Grace of Silence. But this morning, Michelle is not the interviewer, but the interviewee. So she's going to be joined on stage by Sean Gibbons, our CEO of the Communications Network. So please join me in welcoming both Michelle and Sean. Thank you, sir. Hey. How are you? Well, give Great. me a hug. I need Great one. Great to see you. We all need one. I had to come up with tissue after listening to Clarence speak. So I guess I should ask you again, how are you feeling? Okay. Inspired. Yes. So let's do well by our friend. Uh, you have had an extraordinary career, and we've known each other for quite a while, but uh, let's talk about something tough. Okay. I'm not afraid of that. I know. <laughs> I run something called the Race Card Project. So. That's fair enough. <laughs> so let's, let's start with a word. It's a word you've written about. Mm -hmm. It's a word that you have thought about. Mm -hmm. It's a word that you wrestle with today, and my guess is tomorrow and for quite some time to come. The word is race. I'm going to let you just have a run at it. Okay. May I give a word of thanks first? How sure. honored I am to be in this room and in front of this group, um, and in particular to take on this subject at this moment in America. Thank you very much for allowing you me honor us. Um, to enter <laughs> this space. So the word race. Um, first, we have to separate the word race from the word racism. Because often when we talk about race, there's a certain toxicity attached to it because of racism. But if you decouple those words, you're able to examine race sometimes as an element in everyday life. Um, race, there's a soci sociologist will describe race as this sort of highly adaptive system created by humans that evolves over time, usually to accrue power to one group of people and to deny it to another group of people. That's big and that's wordy and you can find that in textbooks. But race is something that is much closer to the ground for most of us. It describes this room. This room has a racial element to it. There's a racial component to this room. Um, it describes history in American life. There's a racial component to most of history in American life. And I have come to do something that maybe puts me in bad odor with some people, is I look for how race impacts almost everything in American life. And, and then people will say, well, wait, oh, why are you always looking for race under every rock? Why are you so focused on race? Well, because it's often there. It's, it's a bit like the weather. You check the weather in the morning, and if the weather is bad, you know that you need an umbrella, right? You know that you need to maybe um, put a raincoat in your, over your shoulder when you head out the door. Um, if it's in Miami and you know it's humid, you're not even going to try to lay your hair down. You know, <laughs> it's just because it's just not going to work, right? Mm -hmm. You just go with it. Um, but if it's a beautiful day and it's 70 degrees outside and the air is crisp, it's not because the weather isn't there. It's just that it's not evident. And I think of race as, as somewhat similar. It's always there. The winds may not be blowing at hurricane, at hurricane force um, impact. But it's, it's often there, and if you're willing to lean in and understand its impacts, you will understand America in a fuller way. You'll understand your own community in a fuller way. And I think you will be much more muscular as a communicator, as a storyteller, or as really anything you do if you're willing to understand its role in American life, in American history, and in your own interpersonal journey. You founded the Race Card Project, and you and I have talked about this offline. You went in with one thought or idea, and yet it confounded your expectations. Can you explain to folks what happened, well, I, what you've encountered? I, I created the Race Card Project um, in 2010, and I had written a book about my family's very complex racial legacy after the... Actually Which you all the, should read. Yes, you should. Um, <laughs> 
But in the run-up to the election of Barack Obama, my family was going through a period of historic indigestion. And I, I don't know if that was happening at your own dinner tables, but people were suddenly talking about things they didn't talk about. My father's from Birmingham, Alabama. I knew the deal. I knew that he had lived in the segregated South. I spent every summer of my youth there. They would send me down to Alabama every summer. Um, but they didn't talk a lot about what life was like in the Jim Crow South. My mother's from Minneapolis, um, from Minnesota, actually originally from Duluth and then Alexandria and Minneapolis, but Minnesota had its own story to tell around segregation. But they didn't talk about it. But suddenly with the election of Barack Obama, they were talking about it all the time. Pass the peace. Let me tell you what happened to me in 1967. <laughs> and I wound up writing a book about some of the things I learned. Um, and when I wrote this book, I went out into the country and I knew I was going to be talking about race. And Sean, I was afraid because I thought that race was this thing that no one ever wanted to talk about. And I was on a 35 city book tour and I was so afraid that I would face audiences where people would fold their arms and cross their legs and just get sort of crunched up in the way that I thought people often did. Oh, why are we talking about this? And so I thought I had to lubricate the conversation in some way. And I was also interested in learning what was going on around America because people at that point were talking about America entering a post-racial space. Mm -hmm. And you can't even say that word now without a bit of a side eye, right? But at that time, everyone was talking about how America had become post-racial. So I wanted to explore race in, that, in, in, in a way that allowed me to get to it very close to the ground again as I was traveling the country. So the idea was that we um, created uh, this, this exercise where we asked people to think about the word race, big word, Difficult word, complicated word, but you only get one sentence to express your views, your thoughts, your anthem, your lament, your triumph, whatever it was, one sentence. And to make sure that people weren't Faulknerian and wrote some big, long, 50-word sentence um, that was really a paragraph, we said you only get six words. And I did it because I thought no one wanted to talk about race, and I'm willing to admit that I was wrong. So you are a professional storyteller, and I hope you all know this. Michelle has had one of the most remarkable careers. She's written for the Washington Post, for the Los Angeles Times, Chicago Tribune, mm -hmm. do I have that right? Uh, obviously, NPR, we met at ABC, ABC News. News. In the Washington uh, Bureau. In the Washington Bureau quite some time ago, and your, your gift, your tremendous talent is telling stories, and yet you can find those stories to six words. Why? Well, with the race card project, with you With the race card project, I mean, it forces you to really put a fine point on it. And when we, when we created the Race Card Project, they were, they were originally postcards. Now most of the submissions come in online. People go to the website or either people use it in their communities. My, um, I now work at the Aspen Institute and the Race Card Project is, is the sort of the fuel behind this project called The Bridge where we try to bring people together. And my team is here, Melissa Barron, Amrit Dillon. And we try to engage people to talk across difference. And we use those stories that come in the Race Card Project because they're candid and they're raw and they help us see the things that um, people talk about in their kitchen tables. White, not allowed to be proud. I'm only Asian when it's convenient. Black children cost less to adopt. You know, my mother hated my dark skin. I worked in radio for 10 years. I never heard anyone say anything close to that behind a hot microphone, and yet people were willing to, on a postcard, to at, in the glow of their computer, on their iPhone or their Samsung device, send in these stories. And then when we asked them to send in backstories, anything else, explain your six words, they would send in essays and photos. And the reason that it's so potent, I think, is that it forces you to just think about, I only get six words, so what's the elemental thing that I want to say? And then that opens the door. That's the crack that lets the light in for then people to go on and tell more of their story. And as a storyteller, I realized that behind the microphone, or even when I went out in the world, I was never getting to these stories because these were so personal. These were things that oftentimes people send us stories that they've never said out loud. I mean, we have one case, a family in Santa Cruz, where three different members of the family have all sent in race cards. And it's all about life in a blended family. And they don't even know that the other members have all sent in cards. Or a husband and a wife He's Iranian, um, she's white American, and they both talk about how their lives changed after 9-11, when suddenly he was viewed as someone who was otherized, you know, in a very significant way. 
Um, and they hadn't even told each other, but they decided to tell us the story. And through that lens and through that prism, we understand America in a, in a very different way. This thing that we're not supposed to talk about, I realize that people do want to talk about it. And, and that once we can get people to open up, now we want to use that as a way to engage people across difference because you can understand what life is lived like by someone else. And that's the difficult thing. We just heard Dr. Jones talk about the segregated South, which was really the segregated America. We talk about the segregated South, but the North was just as segregated. And at that point, there were laws and customs um, that kept people so far apart from each other that it felt like there was a, a, a moat that was 100 miles wide and a wall that was 100 miles tall that kept us from seeing each other because that's what segregation, that, that's the template that segregation set. We don't have that template anymore. We have all these devices that allegedly allow us, allow us to see inside each other's lives. We have reality TV programs that you know, allow us to give a bird's eye view into someone's home, but we still don't see each other. We still don't understand what life is like you know, on different sides of an issue. And I hope in some way that this project has some social utility to allow people to not agree with each other necessarily, but at least understand why someone has that perspective why they settled on that particular point of view, which I don't understand, but I'm at least going to try to understand how they got to that. Can I spill the beans on what we're gonna to try to do mm -hmm. later? Okay. So for all of you, Michelle has graciously uh, agreed that over the next year or two or more, and we're still figuring this all out, the network is gonna collaborate with the folks at the bridge to try to bring, bring some conversations together involving all of you so that we as a sector, as a field, can get better at understanding this issue because, and this is, I guess, going to segue into a question, we may be doing some harm unintentionally that there's a lot of ideas out there. For those of you who are around, we had a conversation with a gentleman named Trabian Shorters who lives here in Miami, and he taught me uh, an idea I wasn't super familiar with, which is a deficit framing, that a lot of the stories that we hear about race mm -hmm. are negative, and they're perpetuated by all of us. So I guess my question to you would be, are we in fact these good folks in the room who woke up today and do every day to make the world a slightly better place in really meaningful ways, are we part of the problem? Well, I'd like to think you're part of the solution because communications is key. It's not the only thing. Dialogue won't get us to a better place alone, but to get to a better place, we need to have robust dialogue and we need to figure out how to have strategic strategies you know, around Strategic communication is important, but sometimes just the small things, creating an avenue for communication, making a space where people can tell their stories, um, modeling in important ways. But we have to think about the prism through which we look at these, issue and the, these issues, the questions that we ask, and even the framing of the questions. So why is it so difficult for black children to learn? You know, why do we have a school to prison pipeline? I mean, social science tells us that sometimes just framing the question in that way, or even talking about the school to prison pipeline, even for people who very much want to attack and interrogate this issue, for the general public, what that does is reminds them of a threat, as opposed to making them think about a solution. So even just framing it in that way, just talking about these issues, has a, a deleterious effect, has the opposite effect that we want to have. And we have to remember that often we're looking at these issues through a majority lens, and majority lens right now is a white lens. So we're thinking about these issues. You have to step back and think about how we approach these issues, how you ask these questions. If you take an issue like the school to prison pipeline, for instance, or the uh, problems with educating children of color, and you frame it in a different way and you talk, think about it as lost potential, You've totally flipped the script, script then. You're, you're walking through a slightly different door that allows for a different kind of communication strategy, that allows for a different kind of, uh, a different set of protocols for trying to attack that. So communications is sometimes as simple as how are we presenting the issue? You know, what door are we walking through as we try to understand the issue? And framing, I mean, George Lakoff has done a lot of work around this. Framing is so important. And if you wind up framing the issue um, the wrong way or in a very pinched way, you wind up um, doubling down on the very problem that you're trying to solve. So we got some work ahead of us. Who's in?
Cool. So I'm going to come back to the six words thing because I continue to be fascinated about this. And we, we chatted earlier. Do you want to tell them the Don Graham story? Because I, I, I feel like the, the Don Graham. Do I have that right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, why I settled on six words? Yeah. Well, there, there are a few reasons. One, I, I knew that there were lots of exercises around six words. And it was a frame that people understood. They did six words Minneapolis and my hometown. Um, six words sports that was a, is a concept that, that was well um, understood. It was you know, all over the media. So I knew that, that people would um, understand it. But I had also lived this personally. Um, I had a college professor who early on, and I still write like this, told me that in order to write something complicated, you have to reduce it to one sentence. And if you can't reduce it to one sentence, you really don't understand the subject matter at hand. You're really not ready to, to attack the story. And I learned this in a very particular way when I worked in the newsroom at the Washington Post. And Don Graham, who at that time was the publisher, um, would walk around the newsroom in this ratty blue Mr. Rogers-like sweater. And, and, it was, and it was wonderful. I mean, it, it, I, I don't think I've ever worked in a newsroom since where someone would leave their office in you know, the tower every day and walk through the newsroom. And he would wander the newsroom, and he would, if you were writing for the front page, he'd want to chat you up a little bit. And you could, um, you could talk your way off the front page if you were too parenthetical. Well, it's, sort of, it's kind of about this, and then there's this person, and then, oh, okay, and you'd go back and tell Ben Bradley or Lynn Downey, oh, she didn't have that, it, you, you might not want to, want to put that story on the front page of the paper. But if you could reduce it to something that was very pithy, very elemental, you're writing about two people who entered Congress at the same time, and now they're both vying for the speakership. It's a classic Cain and Abel tale. Oh, you get that, right? So I learned how to do that um, as a strategic. It, it was basically strategic communications, right? Right. Um, but it also helped me just wrestle the story to the ground so that I really understood it. So I knew that that six-word idea had power. But that's not where you started. This is, I hope, I hope you'll share it the way we talked about it a little bit earlier, which is um, most of us here probably fell in love with the idea of communicating maybe through writing when we first mm -hmm. learned to pick up a pen and draw our letters, whatever it might be. Tell me about when you first fell in love with story, stories, I and found yourself on this path. Yeah, I, I grew up in a family. Um, I believe that much of what we learn in life, the important lessons in life come from the tables that you sit at in your childhood. You know, so much of the important lessons in life are learned at the dining room table, at the Formica table in the kitchen, at the counter, at your grandmama's table. And I'm um, from a big, loud black family. And whether we were in Minnesota, where people are Minnesota nice but really loud when they get around the dinner table, or in Alabama, where people were just loud and raucous and told stories, I was surrounded by robust storytellers, people who had a lot to say. It was not a quiet dinner table. Um, and I was raised by parents who loved words. Um, my parents did not go to college. And that is, I, I'm so sorry that they didn't, because I think they would have had so much more to offer the world than, than, than um, they were able to, because of the opportunities for them were relatively pinched because of the time that they lived in. Um, they didn't go to college, and yet they were two of the smartest people I've ever known. They surrounded our home with books. Um, I don't know if you remember the Book of the Month Club. Mm -hmm. um, you know, books would arrive every month. My parents were postal workers, and, and they still do this in whatever city you live in, but there was, the, used, there was the, the dead books sale at the post office. And this is before the age of Amazon, so I can only imagine what the sale would be like today. But for books that didn't get where they were going, they just collected them, and books take up a lot of space. So the main post office in Minneapolis every year had this amazing book sale where brand new books were five cents, 10 cents. And we got a new set of encyclopedias every year <laughs> because we would go and we would get, you know, they were there at the, at the, at the, the book sale. Um, they subscribed to the New York Times at a time where people didn't do that necessarily in the Midwest. And well, they actually didn't, they didn't subscribe. They went to Shin, Schinders in Minneapolis. If there's anybody here from Minneapolis who remembers Schinders, the bookstore, um, the, the newspaper stand in downtown Minneapolis, and they would buy the Sunday paper, and then they'd dine out on that all week. My dad would take the sports and the business section. My mom would attack the book section. And, and so as a kid, I, I just, 
you know, I loved stories, but my mom would tell you that um, I always had my nose in a book. I always kept journals, those silly little journals that had the, the little lock and key that, that never worked, and your sisters would go into your room with a bobby pin and, you know, and <laughs> open it up and read all about your crushes and, your, and how you were crushed in life. Um, and that I, I would, <laughs> and my mom says I would go around the neighborhood and I would write stories about our neighbors. And, and now that I understand what this meant because we were the first black family and our neighborhood was integrated because we integrated it. <laughs> we were the first black family. Every family whose house touched ours immediately put their house up for sale. And the people who stayed, stayed mainly because they had to. Because at that point, the word was out that Negroes were coming. Their housing values plummeted. They couldn't sell their house even if they wanted to. And if they did, they would sell it as a loss. So they stayed, and integration was sort of forced upon them. And over time, I had deep friendships with them. My parents developed deep friendships. But when I was young, it was a really tense period. And I was knocking door to door on the West Figs and the O'Malley's door and the Bowman's. And, and write, I'd write stories about them, and then I'd sell them <laughs> to my neighbors. So I wrote this story about you, and I'd like to sell it to you. <laughs> and it's kind of like extortion, right? Because <laughs> there's no way you're not going to go and find five cents, you know, to give to this kid. And that's, I guess, where it started. I'm going to have to tell my wife to make sure we have some money around the house. <laughs> or tell your girls to start writing that's stories. That's a great that's idea. <laughs> Zoe and Lily, I'll get to you later, but uh, wow. Um, I'm still processing that. Uh, <laughs> you wrote a piece recently that moved me. I actually sent you a note just after I read it, and it just dropped me to the floor. It was incredible. I've sent it out to you guys in the app. If you haven't had a chance to read it, please, when you get on the plane or you're heading home, you find a few minutes. I know life is busy, but Michelle wrote the cover story for National Geographic about a year ago now mm -hmm. uh, to help I guess to celebrate the opening of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And I read this piece and I know that you all have listened to Michelle, she's been in your car, she's been in your living room, but I always think of you first and foremost as the most beautiful writer. Oh, thank you. The way thank that you. you think and express yourself is just extraordinary. And after absorbing it and taking such a deep pleasure in it, um, my thought was, how the hell did she do that? So how the hell did you do that? <laughs> well, the National Geographic wanted to write a piece for the opening of the museum. And if you haven't gotten to Washington to see the museum, make your way there. You need to plan, because getting the tickets is really, really hard. Oh, yeah. um, but they've made it easier, and it's streamlined now, and you just have to know in advance. But the idea was that it would take a long time for people to get to Washington who didn't live in DC, so the idea was to bring the museum to them through the pages of the magazine. And the difficult thing was, what do you write about? What five or six artifacts do you choose to focus on to tell? But you chose artifacts. I did. I decided to, to tell it through artifacts. So I, I, but also through the curators and their journey to find the artifacts and to understand those artifacts. So that's the way I decided to, to tell the story, was to pick certain artifacts and then their journey on the way to the museum. So there, so there was sort of a frame there. And, um, and it's worth noting, the museum had almost nothing when Lonnie got started. It, it, was, it was the first time a museum ever opened, a Smithsonian museum opened without an existing collection. And so this was... He, Think about that. They, 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 but they knew that, they knew that this history, this history is, it did not exist. It had, not, it had been collected to some degree. The, the lunch counter from the Woolworth sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina is at the American History Museum. Um, there are certain pieces of it. The Tuskegee Airmen's airplane was at the museum of um, the Air and Space Museum. Mm -hmm. But this is a history that had not been valued. And so curators had not gone out and really captured some of this at the Smithsonian in, in, a, you know, in a very intentional way um, it, that existed in smaller museums around the country. But they felt that since the National Mall is where the world comes to understand America. Lonnie believed that you can't understand America, and I happen to agree with him. I, when he says this, I always feel like a silent amen. 
um, you know, I want to utter a silent amen because he says you cannot understand America unless you also understand the role of race in America. If you are trying to understand America and you're not looking at the role of race in the creation of this great country and in you know, every step, every milestone, race has some element and he wanted to capture that. Not to rub America's noses in this difficult history but to understand both the toil and the triumph you know, that is captured when you look at this. And so he believed that this history was was out there to be gathered in the form of artifacts and oral history. Um, but the artifacts that they existed in people's closets and in their basements and in the trunk in their attic. And so he traveled the country for a few years before he, he opened this and he would have his own version of Antiques Roadshow. And people would, he didn't call it that, but it was, he would he'd basically say, bring out your artifacts. And people would come and they would bring incredible, incredible things. And, so that's how they built the museum. And then as word came out, word got out, people would call. And so one of the stories that I told was Nat Turner's Bible, uh, you know, which the Nat Turner Rebellion took place in Southampton, Virginia. He was very religious. In fact, he thought a solar eclipse, much like the one we just saw in August, was what he, he, he interpreted as a sign from God. And that set him on his course to plan this, um, this rebellion. The Bible that he kept with him in a breast pocket existed all these years. And a woman, Wendy Porter, had called the museum. And she called over and over and over again and couldn't get through. Because they, you know, they were trying to feel these calls, but it was sometimes difficult to get it's back to everybody. staff when they started. Yeah. yeah there was no, you guys think of it now as a building. It was no right. building. No, it was no, they were in, they were, they were in the in, FAA building they or were in, right? And they were in different buildings, so they, oh, yeah. uh, they actually weren't all together. And um, Rex Ellis, a curator who got his start at the Williamsburg um, Living Museum in Williamsburg, was walking down the hall. Uh, he's someone who drinks a lot of Diet Coke, and he had, and he, when you see him, he often has those big, like, slurpy things of Diet, like the big, huge Diet Coke. Big gulp. He, he, big gulp, yes. <laughs> and he was walking down the hall, and he just heard someone talking about, there's this woman who keeps calling about Nat Turner's Bible, and he said he spilled it all over himself. What? What? And he went back and got her number and called her, and it turned out he grew up not very far from her, and sometimes it's preordained. You know, I, sometimes history just finds the right conservator. And he was going home to see his family, and he decided to make a stop. And they had the Bible wrapped up in a tea towel that was in their closet, and and discovered um, that the and the and this is a, a wonderful origin story that the Bible um, had been when he was executed, uh, it had been placed in a drawer in the Southampton courthouse. And then over time, given to the family, uh, Francis family, of one of the few people that actually survived the rebellion. And so over years, it had sat in people in a parlor, displayed on a piano. And then over time, it moved from family member to family member. And um, at one point, Wendy, as a young girl, had taken it to school for show and tell in a Jansport backpack. And the teacher. Um, and, you know, when she and this is Nat Turner's. You know, this is this is my mother's spatula, and this is my father's this, and this is and this is Nat Turner's Bible. <laughs> and, and the teacher, understanding history, said, "Oh, honey, let me take that," and called her family and said, "You really ought to do something with this." And so it wound up in a safe deposit box, and it was placed in a safe deposit box um, at a bank that was robbed twice. And they didn't make it inside the safe deposit boxes, so it was OK. And then finally um, worked its way. Oh, but there was one more stop. She actually took it. She, she long felt that it should have a home. And she took it to, um, she took it to a, the actual Antiques Roadshow. The PBS show. The PBS show. Okay. She actually brought it. And she, she, you know, this is Nat Turner's Bible. And they weren't interested. <laughs> they had no interest at all. She dug up the pictures and sent them to me. And you know, and I don't know if they weren't interested or if they were like, woo, we don't know what, we don't, that's kind of deep for <laughs> Friday night. You know, I'm not sure that we want to <laughs> touch that. So it wasn't clear, you know, why they decided to back away from it, but, but they did. And then years later, and the story continues, just last weekend, there was a reunion because it turns out that the descendants of Nat Turner and the descendants of the, the, the Francis family live in the same area. And she, is the PTA captain with one of the descendants of the Nat Turner family. And so they just had a reunion. Oh, wow. Um, and it, you know, out of view, it wasn't widely covered. I think it was in the Southampton County paper. 
but she called me to tell me that they were coming together. And I believe that these kind of stories are all around us. You know, that's what, you know, you could, you could, shot, you could be like Antiques Roadshow, I'm not touching that, too controversial. But boy, if you lean into it, you learn so much more about who we are as, as Americans and how we can find connections to each other. So all the folks in this room work in communications for good. Uh, I think we're all trying to make sense of this moment that we're in and to make sense of this time that we're in. We're in this new era where things are going past us at a thousand miles an hour mm -hmm. and new devices and new technologies are emerging that are allowing us to leap across oceans at the speed of life. Incredible. Now, you have spent your career in newspapers, in radio, television. Um, what do you make of all of this? The moment that we're in now, that could be loaded if you want to go at it, be my guest, or um, just trying to get out into this really crowded information age that we all live in. How do you do it? Well, you, you just have to sort and siphon and figure things out. I mean, we, yes, we have a lot of communications coming coming at us at all different, communication is coming at us at all, at all different angles. I mean, we, we in, there are things that concern me about that. You know, I've been a journalist for a long time. I think it has had, there's some negative effects and there's some positive effects on journalism. Um, you have to feed the beast all the time now. You know, not only do you have to write on deadline, you have to file uh, for the website and you have to send out sort of something on Twitter or Facebook or Snapchat to show that you were in the moment, which cuts into the time that you have to be um, analytical to actually, you know, the, so the nature of your reporting has changed and the nature of your communication has changed. As a consumer, you know, we, we used to worry that the golden age of journalists was behind us. I think the golden age, we're living in the golden age of journalism. I mean, look at what's happening at the Washington Post and the New York Times. They're an arm race to cover what's going on in Washington, D.C. Um, I think that we are seeing a very robust and important moment in American journalism. And yet, for consumers, you know, I always say that, that, that uh, it's a little bit like, like your, your media diet. You have to pay attention to it, just like your actual diet. Because if you're, if you're getting most of your news online, how deep are you reading? How much of that is actually um, aggregated for you? So, these algorithms, they pay attention to what you like, and then they start to feed you what you like. And then you are just reading what you, it, you know, reading only the things that affirm or confirm what you actually believe. And if you're reading online, it's a little bit like, you know, I always say it's like snacking on Cheetos. You actually need some protein in your diet, you know, and, and you can find that at NPR. But you can, you, <laughs> you, and that's for real. But you need to make sure that you're, that you, you're actually reading in depth. Um, but in terms of the way we communicate with each other, I think it makes the job for communicators, again, their positive and negative effects. You can reach a, a lot of people quite easily, and you can reach them in an intimate space because you can reach them through Twitter and Facebook and Snapchat um, and things like that. And, 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 uh, but at the same time, it's hard to control the message because stories become anaerobic. We now know that there's, you know, fake news is a thing. I, I, I don't like the terms fake news because if it's fake, it's not actually news. So I would say manipulated communication instead of fake news. But you know that people are manipulating the way we communicate with each other, and, and we were infiltrated. We now know by Russia that created all kinds of fake accounts, and they understood on this issue of race. They understood us around race in some ways better than we understood ourselves. They understood that it was a divisive issue. They understood that it could be used as a wedge issue, and they did that quite, you know, quite effectively. In, um, in the last election, but if you, but if you look at the, the events of the last week, you have to just cast a, 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 a more careful eye and a broader eye. And I'll use this week as an example with the Take a Knee protests and the news that, you know, that flowed out of that. And you saw people burning their tickets and burning their, their, uh, their jerseys. Um, and this real debate that was playing out in communities where you know, one community couldn't understand why would you do this to dishonor the American flag and another community couldn't understand why don't you understand that when we leave the field you know, that we are seen as men of color and when we drive off the parking lot in our very fancy sports cars that no one sees us as athletes, they just see us as black men and therefore we're targets that our sons are targets, that our relatives are targets, that you, know, that, that you saw this, this debate. 
And it was a week where I thought, boy, America's, they're just not talking to each other. There's just, it's such a week of negativity around race. And then last night, something lands in my inbox, sent to me by like six different people with the US Air Force commander. And I'm, I land here because it shows the power of communication. Um, the, a lieutenant general at the US Air Force Academy called everyone in because there was an incident there. I don't know how many of you saw this, but there were some cadets at the prep school of the academy and uh, an awful slur was painted on some of their dorm rooms, you know, N-word go home. And he pulled everybody in and he was not quite Lou Gossett and an officer and a gentleman, but he was pretty close. And he just said, if you do not know how to treat people with respect and dignity, this is not the place for you, get out of here. This is the way we're gonna do things here. We sat down, apparently they had people come together and talk about Charlottesville, and they had people come together and talk about Ferguson, and he is using his role, again, strategic communications. I'm not gonna be afraid of this, we're gonna lean into this, I am going to say that I value diversity, that the military is stronger because of it. Interesting, because that's not where the military always was. My father served in a very integrated, a very segregated military. You know, where he was not treated as a full citizen, but he says, this is the military that we have today, this is the rules of engagement in my office. And so those stories are out there if you can, you know, if you can find them, but again, it's hard, you have to be careful because the torrent that comes at you um, can somehow set the tone for the way that we communicate, and you have to set an inner compass for what's important to you. And I think as communicators, I believe that you all have such an important role in this moment such an important role because we have to figure out how to listen to each other. We have to figure out how to create pathways um, for communication and you all have the ability to model this within your own organizations and in the stories that you tell. It's so important right now to um, walk with, with dispatch, to walk with courage, to walk with the t intent around these issues, um, to take risks but also to, you know, I run something called the race card. I hope that all of you have a grace card in your back pocket. Because if you decide to engage around these issues, at some point someone is gonna offend you. At some point someone is, as my mother says, someone's gonna step on your corns and it's not gonna feel good. And you have to decide in that moment, if you shut it down or if you pull, you know, okay, I'm gonna give you the grace card today and we're gonna figure out how we can continue to stay engaged with each other, even though you really make me mad. Even though together as we try to take this journey, we're gonna face actual peril. And when you talk about race, there is actual peril. Bad things can happen to you. Careers are changed if you say the, right, the wrong thing, right? Mm -hmm. You can be pilloried. Um, black Twitter is a real thing. They'll come at you hard, you know? If, and, and, and that can, you know, companies sometimes back away from things. Individuals back away from things. And to decide that you're gonna continue to lean into that, um, despite the peril, again, it requires that inner compass. I'm gonna continue to do this because I know it's right. I'm gonna be careful about the way I communicate. I might misstep sometimes, but you know what? My heart is in the right place. And I'm doing this because I believe I'm doing the right thing and I want to honor you by hearing your story even if I don't agree with it. We're going to take questions in one quick second. You and I were having lunch a couple months ago and you said something and you've actually said it to me a couple times since which is that, I'm going to put words in your mouth, but some of the most woke people are some of the biggest oh, perpetrators you know, of the problem. Well, you know, the, woke people. The, 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 the hardest people to awaken are the ones who think they're woke. Thank you. That's what you said. Um, and it sounds better when she says it, doesn't it? But it's kind of true, you know, because you think that you've already checked that box or you're doing, you know, you're doing the good work. And all of us need to be introspective, every single one of us. I have learned so many lessons um, in the work that I do around the Race Card Project. My team, we've learned so many lessons in the work that we do at the bridge. We try to, it is as the name suggests, we try to bring people together to talk across difference, to talk across the difficult stuff. And it's like playing with fire. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you, you make missteps. And again, we just have to say we're in this for the right reason and we're gonna figure out how to stay at the table um, despite that. But sometimes, if you feel like you're in the right space, because of that, you're less introspective. You're less willing to think about, okay, what is my lens here? You know, and again, this, this notion that we have to like look in the spaces that we exist. 
if you are working in an organization and you know that your mission is, is strong and you know that your heart is in the right place and yet your management structure overwhelmingly represents the at present majority culture and yet your administrators are largely people of color. That didn't happen by accident. How did you get to that space? And are you comfortable with that? You know, you have to constantly ask, you have to constantly do a personal inventory around these issues. Um, and you become stronger communicators when you're willing to do that. And um, you have a stronger story to tell when you're willing to do that, but it's really hard. It's really hard to do because it requires that you see things that you might not like in yourself. And you have to recognize that even if you are ordering your steps in the right way, that you might not cast your lens wide enough to really fully understand the perspective of people who need your help, could use your help, or could actually you could honor them by just listening to their story. And that's often where it begins. Questions, we're gonna go to those right now. Get some hands raised. Anybody out there? While we're waiting for hands to raise, up in the front, Sandy, while the mic's coming to you, I apologize in advance because this might tick you off. Um, uh oh. Uh, I'm about to push a button. I, I, I am. I'm sorry. Uh, Michelle's best friend uh, was, is Gwen Eiffel. Yeah. And uh, you shared with me just a moment ago, today is the day that she passed. No, today's her birthday. Birthday, birthday. Yeah, today's okay. her birthday. I fucked it up. Um, and I know you miss her. I miss her terribly. I miss her terribly. If you were having a chat with Gwen today, and not me, and we didn't have a whole bunch of people in the room, and she said, what's going on? What would you tell her? Okay, so um, you did press a button. Um, Gwen is my best friend. It's hard for me to talk about her in the past tense. She was, uh, um, she's godmother to my kids. She's maid of honor in my wedding for 30 years. We have always lived five blocks from each other. So we were always close enough because we traveled a lot. She moved, I moved, I moved, she moved. Um, and if she were still here, we would be talking all the time because we talked several times a day. And we stayed in the business, crazy business of journalism. I think we kept each other in the business because we could call each other, girl, I'm having a TV day today. <laughs> Um, and we talked, you know, constantly, all day long. And we would be having robust conversations about what's going on, you know, in, in this moment. But I, I think her legacy is that she always asks the tough question. I mean, I think of, if you saw the last, she did two vice presidential debates, she's done several debates. The last debate she did was in Milwaukee this year with, um, with Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. And what most people didn't know is that in the middle of that, she was going through chemo. She looked great. You know, she was still dedicated to the work. And I think about um, the question she asked that evening. Because usually when we talk about race, it's a conversation that's by, for, or about people of color, right? Right. I mean, that's the way it's framed so often in American culture. And she said, you know, we need to talk about white people tonight. She said, and, we all, and she basically said that when we talk about race, it's usually this kind of conversation, but let's talk about white people. And you could hear people in the audience, I was in the room because I traveled to Milwaukee with her, and you could hear people in the audience like, <gasps> we're gonna talk about white people? <laughs> well, hello, you check a box too. You know, when you fill out the census, it's not like you're unraced. I mean, the creation of the, you know, the, the, the racial paradigm in this country is a total human construct with very real consequences, but when we talk about race, it usually means we're gonna talk about the at present minority culture. And I keep saying at present because the future is arriving ahead of schedule. Things are changing very quickly. And in some places, those words don't even apply. If you live in certain places in Texas or California, I mean that, you know, we need new terms. Um, but she had bravery around these issues. If you remember when she was uh, moderating the debate between Dick Cheney and um, John Edwards, you know, she asked a question that neither one of them were, were prepared for. Um, she asked about AIDS in America and that black women were in the bullseye of the epidemic at that point and still today. And, and they were just befuddled. They had no, oh, no one, this was not in my briefing book. I, you know, I have no answer. But she put that issue on the table for everyone to think about. And, and she leaves um, a, a beacon for us to follow and something for us to think about, you know, in terms of the courage and having 
these kinds of conversations. I, I believe that in that sense, she is still very much with us. Sandy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Hello, Michelle. Can you Michelle. stand up? I'm sorry, yes. Sandy. I'm going to okay. put you on the spot, but I know who you are. Maybe other Is folks okay? don't. Just stand up. Hello, your name and Sandy who you're Smith, Cal Wellness. Um, I'm wondering about race trainings, right? You, they, people come into your office, they give you a training on race, how to talk about the issues, they leave, there you are. Do they work? Do they really make a difference in how people interact with one another? Are they positive? Are they negative? And how could they be helpful? Um, Sandy, thank you for your, for your question. I think there's a broad spectrum. You know, diversity training uh, is, is something that often people view as an eat your peas exercise. Oh, we have to do the diversity training. And now when you do it online, they actually, you do it online and they measure that you actually get to the bottom and you have to get the certificate and you get the certificate, but really there's an email that goes back to the uh, HR department that says that you actually finished your training and if you don't finish the training, you get dinged, you didn't do your diversity training. Um, so they, you know, they, they range in spec spectrum. Some of them are, are hands-on where people actually come in. So I, I, it's hard for me to assess whether they work. Some work really well. Some don't. I mean, the larger question that I have about that, and now with the work that we do at the bridge, we do this kind of work. We don't call it diversity training, but we work with organizations. We work with churches. We work with businesses. We work with municipalities and school systems. And the thing that we try to do is to create a space where we can kickstart the conversation by bringing people together so that they can talk across difference. But we always talk about a long tail, that there has to be a strategy for a long tail. It cannot be a one-time event where you bring people together. And if it's really effective, it means you're sort of dredging things up. It means that you're, you're putting things out there that people are, are thinking about. And then if it's, you don't have a long tail, then everyone goes back and you haven't really worked through everything, or you haven't. And, and you know that um, one of the things I know from journalism, for instance, is if you have the benefit of doing a long-term story, one of the things I learned, and it was humbling to me, and I learned this early on in journalism, and I always appreciated being able to do long-form journalism, because if you go out and interview someone, the stories that you are told in the, your notebooks at the beginning, you wind up, they're minimally useful to you. Because the longer time that you spend with someone, by the third or fourth or the fifth notebook, then you're starting to really get the story. People are very aspirational at the beginning, and they'll tell you the story that they, that they think that they need to hear themselves. So this takes time. And to do it just once usually is not enough. And if you really are trying to build an open and inclusive culture, uh, you have to create a way to honor that, to celebrate that, to interrogate and examine that. And you can't do that on Tuesday afternoon between 3 and 4 o'clock. There's just not enough time to do that. So. Um, I would, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to, you know, m provide any kind of uh, marking or analysis of these programs because they're so vast and broad in spectrum, but the things that I do know that they work best if they don't happen, um, that they happen over time and that it's, it, it is a much more deliberative process and that there's a sort of a long-term strategy and a long-term goal. We're going to take one more question because we're a little over time, guys. While the mic is getting run, other questions? See um, some hands. Oh, there we are. Hi, I'm Millie Hawk Daniel from Policy Link. And Can you speak up? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. How's that? <laughs> um, I um, the vi I'm the vice president of communications at Policy Link, and I wanted to just ask the question, uh, Michelle. You've talked a lot about courage. I, as I go to conferences around the country, I, in, including this one, I've had uh, white people ask me about talking about race. Um, at one conference a few years ago, somebody asked, is it okay for me to talk about race? Uh, I've had people say they don't know how to do it. Um, and I, everything you've said today, I totally agree with. Um, I know we're short of time. What would you say to people who, all of us, not just white people, but black people and everybody, um, as kind of a parting word, uh, or, or six words maybe, um, to, to talk about what, you know, not only is it okay, but it's absolutely necessary, and that if we as communicators can't model that, um, we should be able to. So, and I've said different things to different people at different times, but I would love to know how you would answer the questions about who, who talks about race, how they do it, and why it's important. So, Millie, thank you very much for, for, the, uh, for the question. Um, when someone asks you if it's, it's okay to talk about race, the answer is yes, it is okay. And yes, it is necessary. 
I mean, again, you know, another thing that landed in my inbox this, this week is Greg Popovich of the, of oh, the Spurs. San Antonio yeah. Spurs. This is the I basketball mean, he, coach. You know, he is obviously on the down low been studying critical race theory because he, like, <laughs> laid it down. I mean, you know, and, um, but he said something that is so important, as did um, the, the lieutenant commander at the U.S. Air Force Academy. It is important that we talk about these issues, not once, but that we continue to talk about these issues. Talk alone won't get us there, but talk will help us understand each other, and it's everybody's work. It's everybody's opportunity. It's not just the work, it's the opportunity to understand the world that we live in. And if we, again, it's reframing, not just that it's work, it's the opportunity to, to do this um, this important kind of work. And, I, and if we can get to the point where we see it as an opportunity instead of just the, the drudgery, the work, the burden of talking about race, then I think we can actually move to um, a slightly different space around these issues. I'm not going to say that this is, a, it, it's never been more important, but I know that it is as important as it could possibly be in this moment. You all have such an important role in America right now in framing the way that we talk around this and so many other issues, climate change, um, you know, so many things. But on the issue of race, I think we can do the next generation a great service by changing the way that we think about this. Race is difficult to talk about in part because we keep saying it's difficult to talk about. And if we change the frame on that, yeah, it, it might be difficult, but or race is an opportunity for us to understand each other. If we can change the framing around that and create a space where we can actually have these conversations. Millie asked my six words, still more work to be done. Uh, we don't live in a ra post-racial society. I don't even know why we would want to. I hope that within my lifetime, and maybe my children's lifetime, that we will see a post-racist society. Those are two different things. Race does not have to be a toxic issue. It describes, we are in Miami. I always say this when I go to college campuses. Think about where we are. We are in Miami. We're at the Fountain Blue Hotel. Let's be real. For a long time, people who looked like me would have a hard time walking through the front door of an institution like this. If you look in the room that you're sitting in, I mean, literally, look around. Look to your right and look to your left. There are women in this room. There are people of color in this room. This is not something that you can ever take for granted in America because within my lifetime, and I am not that old, this is it's not something that you could take for granted. This would be highly unusual. Cops would be called if you, know, you saw a room with this kind of competition in a state like Florida. Let's be real. So don't take it for granted. Honor it by recognizing the work of people like Clarence Jones and the litany of soldiers and saints that he mentioned when he was at this podium. They fought for us to sit in rooms like this. They used their voices. And he worked for a great man who told us that silence is part of the problem. That's what the letter from the Birmingham jail was all about. And Clarence was the person who took the little scraps of paper out of the jail to make sure that that letter got to all of us so that we can read and examine it and honor it all these years later. You were given voices. Use those voices. And you were also given these ears. And God, I think, gave us two of them and one of these because listening is so important. That would be a great place to close, but it's not where I want to close. So I'm going to take the privilege of the last question. I hope you've gotten a sense of what a beautiful, remarkable, thoughtful human being is sitting beside me. He's one of my favorite people. We've known each other for quite some time. I'm going to give a quick aside because I want to thank you. Uh, and you haven't let me. I've tried a few times. When I was very young, I was probably 24, 25, I was going to a job at CNN, I was leaving ABC News, and Michelle took me out to a very fancy restaurant that I could not afford, I think it was the Iron mm -hmm. Gate, and we sat outside, and she pulled out a box, and she handed it to me and said, you will need this. And she said it with her Michelle Norris voice, you will need this. I opened it up, it was stationary with my name on it. She gave me my name. And she said, you will use this because this will help you. And then she wrote a series of letters, and she was just extraordinary. So thank you. You're welcome. What can I say? I'm the daughter of postal workers. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was all about. It was about selling stamps. There we go. But 
But my question is, because I want to leave this on a really hopeful note. This has been, I think, a, a hopeful conversation. What brings you joy? What makes you happy? My kids. My kids bring me joy. Um, I have three of them. And uh, watching them grow and go out into the world um, brings me the greatest joy possible. My husband brings me great joy. I love him like my next breath. My garden brings me joy. Um, and this work brings me joy, as difficult as it is. I mean, it, there's a lot of indigestion. The inbox, you know, there's a lot of angst in the, in the inbox. But there's also epiphanies and reunions and the fact that people give us their trust. You know, that, that, um, that gives me great joy. I feel so honored to be alive and present at this moment, you know, in, in, in the universe. Um, I am eternally optimistic. Maybe it's, you know, part of my DNA in growing up in Minnesota. Um, and despite, you know, th these are troubling times. You know, I, I wake up quite often, what happened? Where are we? What? You know, there's, there's a sense of vertigo. Um, and yet my inner compass, um, the, the meter, you know, that little needle, tends to move toward joy and hope. And I'm fortunate in that. Michelle Norris. Thank you Thank very you for much. the gift of this last hour. Thank you. Okay, we went a little over. I hope you don't mind. I think it was worth your time. Uh, we're going to go right to breakouts. You're happy to be welcome. Yeah, I can't speak anymore. Uh, you can talk to folks as you walk down that really, really, really long hallway. We'll see you back here for our final keynote soon. Thanks, guys.